Secondly, according to Mr. Curry's above answer, an intruder may be acknowledged a minister of the Catholic Church when yet he owns he cannot look up to him as the lawful minister of that congregation into which he is intruded. But I ask Mr. Curry why he cannot look up him, look upon him as a lawful minister of that congregation. Mr. Curry must answer according to his above words. It is because the body of the Christian people have upon sufficient grounds opposed his settlement. If I should ask Mr. Curry further, is not the Presbytery's authority appointing him a minister of that congregation sufficient to make him their lawful minister? Mr. Curry must still answer in the negative for his reasons above given. But I ask again, why does not the Presbytery's authority interposed in this matter make the intruder the lawful minister of this particular congregation? For my part, I humbly judge it is because the laws and institutions of the head of the church are counteracted. It is because the covenant of Levi is corrupted in this particular instance, and consequently the intruder has given just ground of offense to the church by his matter of entry into the holy ministry. Thirdly, is not every particular visible church a part of the Catholic body, or does not every particular church stand in relation to the Catholic as a part unto the whole? Hence, hence, a scandalous entry into the holy ministry not only affects that particular congregation into which one is intruded, but also the whole Catholic body. Unless Mr. Curry will say that the transgressing of the laws and institutions of Christ may be just ground of scandal and offense to one part of the body and not to the whole. And if he says so, I affirm he overthrows the unity of the Catholic Church, and consequently that he is unsound in this particular also. And therefore, for the above reasons, when Mr. Curry tells his reader that an intruder may be a lawful minister of the Catholic Church, and yet is not a lawful minister of that congregation, as I humbly judge this is a new coin distinction, so the design and tendency of it is to blindfold and hoodwink simple, well-meaning people, and to bring them to the same submission to the ministry of intruders, when a more particular and special testimony is lifted up at this time against this course of violence that is practiced upon the Lord's heritage in Scotland. Fourthly, Mr. Curry, above answer, Mr. Curry in his above answer affirms that intruders may be acknowledged, quote, as the lawful ministers of such in that congregation as have called them, unquote. That is, they may be acknowledged as lawful ministers to the patron, inheritor, or to or to a few of the congregation. This appears to me to be both new and inconsistent doctrine. Mr. Curry should have rather told his reader that he gives up with our parochial order. Do not all our Presbyterian divines own that every parochial church is a particular visible church, and are not intruders by the authority of the Presbytery appointed ministers over that particular visible church? But according to Mr. Curry's doctrine, if the intruder be a lawful minister to such as have called him, then a patron or, and two or three heritors with a few in the congregation may make up a particular visible church. And consequently we must either have a particular visible church within a particular visible church, or else such as will not submit to the intruder as their lawful minister must be reckoned renters and dividers of that particular church. This is indeed agreeable to the doctrine advanced by the modest and humble inquirer and his fellows, whose pen I conceive Mr. Curry has borrowed upon the present argument, but whether he is consistent with himself or with our Presbyterian principles and his reasonings, I shall leave it to the reader to judge. The second question which I put to Mr. Curry in the defense on page 126 is whether or not gospel ordinances dispensed by such as are neither lawful nor sent ministers of Christ have the rectitude or purity in their administration which the divine institution requires. Upon which he answers in the vindication on page 128, quote, I think gospel ordinances dispensed by such as are neither lawful nor sent ministers of Christ and such as having usurped the office without either the people's call or presbytery's ordination may have the rectitude and purity but as to the matter in outward form, which the divine institution requires, though I do not think their administrations are valid, wanting the presbytery's ordination, which, in my opinion, in ordinary cases, is absolutely needful to constitute one a lawful minister of Christ, unquote. As to Mr. Curry's above answer, I grant him that ordinances dispensed by intruders and usurpers of the ministerial office may have a rectitude and purity as to the matter, but then... I refuse that they have the rectitude and purity as to the outward form which the divine institution requires. And my reason is that though I cannot conceive what Mr. Curry understands by the terms outward form, yet according to any understanding I have of the above terms as used in the present argument, I humbly judge that a lawful vocation unto the work of the ministry is requisite unto the outward form, and so unto the pure administration of gospel ordinances, 
And therefore, though a man should deliver sound doctrine, though he should dispense the sacraments without any mixture of human inventions, if he has not the ordinary outward call, his administrations want that purity and rectitude as to their outward form, which the divine institution requires. Such men who want the ordinary outward call, they run unsent, and no man ought to take this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And whereas Mr. Curry affirms that the administrations of intruders, etc., are not valid if they want the Presbytery's ordination, he appears to me in this to be unsound likewise, and because the word Presbytery import a college of presbyters, but our Reformed divines have always sustained the administration of such to be valid who have been ordained by one single man, as, for instance, the administrations of such as are ordained by the diocesan bishop are still sustained sustained, excuse me, as valid, though I think they have not that purity and rectitude as to their outward form which the divine institution requires, while they justify their corrupt manner of entering the holy ministry. And although I am of opinion that the presbytery's ordination is needful in ordinary cases to constitute one a lawful minister of Christ, yet I will not say it is absolutely needful to render the administrations valid. I doubt if Mr. Curry himself will reckon the administrations of such of the sectarian party invalid, who content themselves with election and refuse the Presbytery's ordination to the office of ministry. As for the case of Mr. Whitfield and others in the Church of England, who, says he, never had such a call as Mr. Wilson requires, I answer, there is a vast difference, as I have already observed, betwixt ordinary cases and extraordinary, as that of Mr. Whitfield's appears to be. Also there is a great difference betwixt the case of such who are pointing towards Reformation and that of others who are settled upon their lees and refuse to be reformed. Mr. Whitfield gives satisfying evidences to the churches of Christ that he lies open to light and is pointing towards reformation, and may the Lord, who I hope has shined upon his, uh, who has shined into his soul, and given him some clear discoveries of the doctrines and of just, of, excuse me, of justification and salvation by the free grace of God, though he imputed righteousness, uh, excuse me, through the imputed righteousness of our Lord Jesus, enlighten him more and more. And particularly with respect to the worship, order, and government of the house of God, the spiritual kingdom of our glorious Emmanuel, whose peculiar prerogative it is to give laws, ordinances, and officers to his own house, as also instructions and directions with respect to the manner of their entry into their respective offices. Mr. Curry thinks fit in the foresaid page to put the following question unto me, quote, whether could one be a lawful minister of Jesus Christ, and administrate sacraments so as they shall be right sacraments, albeit he had accepted of a call, where there were only heritors and elders, a third part of the people, with a majority of the presbytery, for his ordination and settlement in that parish, unquote. To which I briefly answer, if, as the question supposes, the majority of the people are against the settlement, then according to Mr. Curry, in his Just Divinum, above quoted, such in one enters by the wrong door, yea, he is not free of the guilt of running unsent. Mr. Curry adds that he hopes I will not refuse that one having special grace may labor under such an error as to think he might accept of a call in the manner mentioned. I answer that I will not refuse this, but when I affirm that men's state, whether gracious or not, is not the rule by which we are to determine the outward and ordinary lawful minister, uh, the outward and ordinary call to the holy ministry. As I do not reckon a gracious state essential to the being of a minister, so neither do I think that the supposition that one is in a state of grace does oblige the church to receive and acknowledge him as a lawful and sent minister of Christ, if he has not the ordinary outward call to the work and office of the ministry. And if Mr. Curry thinks that a man's ignorance of the error of his way, or is continuing in this ignorance, Suppose he may be in a state of grace is a sufficient warrant is, is a sufficient warrant, excuse me, for the church to receive him as a lawful and sent minister. I must look upon this as another of his erroneous principles. I shall not question that some of the Jansenist ministers who are more found, uh, who are more sound upon the doctrine of grace than the rest of the popish clergy may be in a gracious state. But yet I affirm that, while they continue in conjunction with their anti-Christian head, they ought not to be acknowledged by the church as lawful and sent ministers of Christ. I conclude this subject in the defense, page 126, with a quotation from Mr. Durham, which Mr. Curry thinks nothing to the purpose, and why? 
because, says he, quote, intruders have at least the outward form of a call and cannot be said to run unsent when authorized by judicatories of Christ to preach the gospel by which they are made ministers of the Catholic Church, unquote. Here again, Mr. Curry contradicts himself. For according to Mr. Park's above words, which Mr. Cor which Mr. Curry quotes with approbation, intruders are not free of guilt of having run unsent. And I have sufficiently proven above that they have not the outward form of a call which divine institution requires. And Mr. Curry has thrust in the author of plain reasons. He accuses me of omitting some of Mr. Durham's words, by which, says he, the reader might have seen that Mr. Durham is plainly against me. But I refuse Mr. Curry's charges unjust, and if he had dealt just, justly with me and fairly with the reader, he ought to have told plainly what the words are which I have omitted. But Mr. Curry slips over a considerable part of the quotation from Mr. Durham, particularly when Mr. Durham tells us that such as are, as are to be accounted to speak without God's commission, who have had a warrantable call to the ministry, yet, quote, by palpable defection from the truth and commission, given them in that call, have forfeited their commission, and so are no more to be accounted ambassadors for Christ or watchmen of his flock than a watchman of the city is to be accounted an observer thereof when he hath publicly made defection to the enemy and taken on with them, unquote. I wish Mr. Curry may seriously consider the above words, which he reckons nothing to the purpose. For my part, I cannot but reckon such who, as Mr. Curry speaks, are guilty of impious robber, sacrilege, and raping, and who refuse to confess the truths of Christ in opposition to the injuries and indignities that have been done to the same, and who are guilty of an habitual series and tract of tyranny in the administration, and who continue to justify themselves in all these. I say, I cannot but reckon that such ha have made palpable defection from the truth, and the commission given them in their call, as is above expressed. And that this is the state of matters with the present judicatories in their ecclesiastical capacity, I have already evinced in the two preceding sections compared with the defense. I have insisted too long upon this head, but I thought it necessary both for the information of such as are willing to receive light and for the direction of the Lord's people in their practice in this cloudy and dark day. I shall endeavor more uh, I should endeavor more brevity on the following heads, because if I should pursue Mr. Curry after the same manner in the question before me, I might soon exceed this voluminous vindication. Section four. Wherein it is shown that the present judicatories continue in a course of defection and refuse to be reformed, though the ordinary means have been used to reclaim them. As the argument for secession is laid in the beginning of this chapter, it is stated in the following manner. When a particular visible church do, in their ecclesiastical or judicative capacity, go on in a course of defection from Reformation purity once attained unto, and will not be reformed after the ordinary means have been used to reclaim them, then, and in this case, the minor part, though but very few in number, may, yea, ought to depart from church communion with the backsliding part, and such as our office bearers may warrantably exercise the keys of government and discipline in a distinct capacity from the majority or the backsliding part. In order to illustrate the argument, it remains that I inquire a little into the branch of the same, into that branch of the same, wherein it is subsumed that the ordinary means have been used to reclaim the present judicatories from their proceeding in a course of defection, but that such means have been used in vain, and that they continue to go on in their backsliding course in opposition to all the means that have been and are used to reclaim them. In the historical narrative, which I give in my introduction to the defense, I take notice of the particular means by which the judicatories were dealt with to stop their course and to return to our Reformation standards. I am not here to repeat what was said in the above-mentioned introduction, but only to notice that immediately before the secession was declared, they were dealt with by a protestation for exoneration entered before the Assembly, 1733, and likewise by the representations that were given to the commission of the said assembly after their meeting August thereafter. But, notwithstanding of these means, they persisted in their sinful course. They thrust out the protesting ministers from ecclesiastical communion with them, whereby they did upon the matter declare that they would regard none of the means that were used for reclaiming them.